Hello, my wonderful, beautiful friends. Guys, welcome back to r slash malicious compliance, where people get exactly what they deserve. And in this episode, a rude property manager who happens to be OP's neighbor tries to mess with OP, and she finds out real quick why that's a huge mistake. Guys, I hope you enjoy today's stories. Hit subscribe if you haven't. And as always, you can send or link your post to this email right here. We're diving in. So in the early 2000s, when I first moved out on my own, I rented from a complex that charged you for assigned parking. It was an upcharge of $25 per month, and if you didn't get assigned parking, you would have to fight for a space on the street. Now, my apartment was in the back of the complex, and I was getting over a recent knee and ankle injury, so I opted for paid parking that was relatively close to my front door. My car was also a junker. It was three years older than I was, but it ran semi-okay and the heater worked. As a newly minted adult, I was happy to have it. So about three months into my lease, my car went to the great scrap heap in the sky. I had gotten used to the local transit system and discovered a nearby store would drop off groceries for me. So I opted to not replace the car and utilize the bus pass that my work reimbursed me for. I then went to my leasing office and told them that I no longer needed the space. And would you please remove the extra charge from my bill? The manager at the desk was new, and she had never been asked that before. She promised to look into it and let me know. Now I was naive, and figured it would be gone come next month, but nope, it was still there. I paid all but the parking space and called up the complex to talk to the same girl. She said she was awaiting word from the higher-ups, and she offered me a credit for the charge as a one-time courtesy. I reminded her that I no longer owned a car, I hadn't just changed my mind about it. I told her that the space had been empty for close to a month now and I won't be utilizing it. She said she understood loud and clear, and she would get it sorted by next month. Three days before the rent was due, she finally got back to me. Apparently, it was in my lease and it couldn't be removed without breaking the lease and signing a new one. She also told me that even if I didn't move out, the lease breaking and the initiation fees would be charged, and my rent would go up to the new current market value. This would be over $1,000, so not an option for someone freshly on their own. It was suggested that I keep paying for the parking spot, so I kept the parking spot on the lease. Three weeks later, I was reviewing my lease to get the phone number for maintenance, and noticed the clause for the parking space. Essentially, I could park a motorcycle, a scooter such as a Vespa, a car, truck, SUV, or trailer in the space. At that point, gears were turning. For me to be in compliance, I had to have wheels on anything parked in my space. So I went around to my local version of Craigslist and I found a wheeled container, similar to a shipping container. It wasn't cheap, but it was worth every cent. Now, the thing about my complex is it offered storage sheds at an upcharge, too. Being fresh out of high school, I didn't have much to store, but my neighbor, though, did. So I throw a lock on the unit and offered it to my neighbor for half the cost of a shed, about $35 a month. He was able to move all of his stuff out of his storage unit, where he was paying over $100 a month, and my container was available 24-7, 365. He was happy for the arrangement and paid several months in advance. The complex put several tow stickers for out of compliance on the trailer, but I called the tow company and faxed them a copy of the lease, where it says trailers are allowed. The container was registered with the county as a utility trailer, so there was nothing they could do. They tried to fine me for improper parking, but again, I had proof that I was well within my rights. They even offered to remove the charge for parking on my lease if I was to relocate the container. But with what my neighbor was paying, I could cover my water bill every month, so I declined. I stayed 18 months, and then sold the trailer to my neighbor when I moved out. He had to rent a car to relocate it to his assigned space, but he said it was worth the couple hundred he paid. He ended up saving over a thousand dollars a year renting from me. Other neighbors even brought in their own containers too, even if it meant getting a second space. The sheds were being vacated at such a large volume that the complex tried to give them away at six months free. Few took them up on it. The complex ended up amending the new lease to exclude trailers, but could do nothing about those that already had them in the spot. And instead of moving out and giving notice, renters would reassign their lease to new people, so they could be grandfathered into the trailer clause. I drove by the facility two or so years after I moved out, going to a friend's for Thanksgiving. The complex had been sold to a new owner, and they changed their name. But wouldn't you know, there was still about a dozen wheeled shipping containers in the parking lot. Guys, I would love to see a picture of this parking lot, and what a beautiful malicious compliance that costed the complex probably thousands of dollars in losses when it came to renting their storage sheds. Like, I just want to say that I love stories where OP paves the way for others, and they should be happy with the way they dealt with this, and for all the people who've benefited from those actions. Not all heroes wear capes, guys.
So this happened about 4 years ago, and I still laugh about it to the day. So my older cousin has a cat named Tara. And Tara is a total loose screw, and she would bite and scratch anyone who so much looked at her funny. And don't even get me started when you dared disturb her when she was sleeping. Never mess with Tara when she's sleeping. Tara only really felt comfortable around my cousin and I. Now here's where the story gets good. So my aunt and uncle were having a family gathering, and they decide to invite some close friends. Among them were some demonic kids who I'll call Mini Bigfoot, who is 6 years old, and Mini Yeti, who is 5 years old. Now those two couldn't sit still or shut up for at least a second, and the parents would just let it happen. They would use the excuse, oh they don't know any better, just let them do whatever. And I always thought, they probably would if you set a boundary or something at least. So while they're downstairs terrorizing the adults and anyone else who was brave and patient enough to be in the same room with them, me, my cousin, and her friend just chill upstairs. They then both leave the room to go run a few errands and buy some more cat toys, as Tara has demolished the previous ones. So I'm left in the room alone with the little furball that's curled up on the bed having a damn good nap. And that's when I hear the sounds of rapid footsteps, and I didn't need to peek out to see who it was. At that moment, the door swings open and both gremlins walk inside the room and immediately point out all the drawings on the walls of Nintendo characters. That's when Mini Bigfoot points out and says, Oh, there's a fluffy kitty on the bed. It was at that point they reach over to pet her and I inch their hands away and tell them to not disturb her. For some background, I'd already had bad beef with the two because when they're at our house, they would always harass my dog, pull its ears and tails constantly, and they wouldn't stop. Mini Yeti starts to whine about how much they love cats and wants to cuddle the little itty bitty. I told her that Tara hates when her sleep is disturbed and they wouldn't go away. They went downstairs to tell their parents and of course the parents tell me, let them pet the cat, it's not even yours, it's just a cat. Now I tried reasoning with them and even my aunt and uncle sided with me, but they still wouldn't understand. They swore it was just a regular house cat. I then walked back upstairs and suddenly I got a huge grin on my face. Malicious compliance. I told the kids that whatever, they can go play with the cat and that's when they start laughing at me and taunting me saying that they're allowed to do whatever. But soon the tables would turn. They went inside the room and I camped outside the door. For about 5 seconds, all I could hear was wow from the kids. And then it finally came. An ear piercing hiss and a loud meow, followed by a distant sound of clothes stretching and gremlins screaming. They both then sprint out of the room crying, and Mini Bigfoot had a big scratch going down his right arm. Little Yeti had it worse, as her nice pink t-shirt was absolutely torn to shreds, and there were much more scratches on her arms. Of course, their parents were furious at me, and commanded me downstairs to scold me for not telling me that the cat was vicious. They asked how I could let the cat scratch their children like that and not do anything about it. I was gonna say something, but then my dad's face went white as he pointed to the stairs. We then looked, and guess what we saw? At the top of the stairs, Tara was right there with her tail hunched back, and her ears were folded flat against her head. To add to that, the lights upstairs were off, so her eyes were glowing. So at this point, the dad of the two kids even thought it was a great idea to punish a cat that wasn't his. So he marches up the stairs while staring down Tara. It was a bad move, because Tara then leaps off the stairs, lands right on the dude's back, and cut a huge gash in his shirt in the process. She then climbed off, and just went back up the stairs and slept again like she didn't almost murder a whole family. When my cousin got back, we told her about this story, and at first, she was mad. And then she starts to laugh when we mentioned that the cat wasn't injured. Tara got a nice plate of tuna for dinner, and a good back rub as a reward. Yeah, so this is exactly why you always have to listen to people, guys. If they say don't touch their pets, especially if they're cats, because we all know cats are freaking unpredictable, right? And as for the dad, like, what the heck did you think you were gonna do, sir? Like, did he really think he was actually going to be able to punish someone else's cat in their own home? Listen, all I'm saying is everybody there learned a lesson that day. So about 4 years ago, I decided to go small, and I got a 29 foot 5th wheel for my 3 cats and myself, and got lucky enough to find a spot in a park that was basically perfect for us. Pretty much anything I needed was within walking distance or a 5 minute drive. My cats were allowed to run around on the provision, they had access to an outdoor litter box that I would maintain in my space, and they didn't cause any problems with noise, fighting with other cats, etc. The rent was good, and it was fixed for 2 years with all utilities included except electric, so honestly, I was thrilled. 
About a year and a half went by, and all seemed well, until one evening I returned home from work to find a note taped to my door. I unfold the note to find that a complaint had been made against my cats to park management, and I needed to come to the office to have a talk about some things. Now, this was my first note from management in my time there, and my only real interaction with them had been the occasional wave as I passed by the office. It was already 6.45, so I decided to wait until the next morning. In the interest of avoiding further complications, I bring my boys inside for the night, and I settled in bed. I awoke around 8.15 to someone pounding on my door, and I opened it to meet Karen. Now I say this because not only did she truly embody the very essence of Karenhood, it was also her name. So me, bleary and barely awake, say, uh, can I help you? Now Karen, on what I can only presume is her fifth bottle of cold brew coffee, says, Hi, so I'm Karen, the new park manager, and we need to have a talk about your cats, okay? And yes, that woman literally said, okay, like a lot. I say to her, yep, I saw your note, and I was planning to come by when I got up. Karen tells me, well, the office has been open since 7 o'clock, so I thought you were avoiding me. Are you avoiding me? I say to her, well, I typically work nights, so I'm not up at 7 o'clock. Karen says, oh, so you're the roll out of bed around noon type then. And I do want to note that this sounded incredibly condescending, whether it was meant to or not. I tell her, uh, yeah, usually closer to 10 o'clock, but I'm awake now. Let me throw on some clothes and I'll be right over, okay? At that, Karen nods awkwardly, probably realizing for the first time how ridiculous she sounded. She then walks back to the office. Now, I'm not a morning person at all. Figuring this wouldn't take too long, I popped in a coffee pod while getting dressed, fed the boys, and then strolled to the office with a cup of coffee in my hand. But no food, water, anything in my system as of yet. Seeing me, Karen says, I was about to start thinking you'd gone back to sleep. Some people are lazy. It had been like 15 minutes maximum since she left. I say to her, sorry, I had to feed my cats and wake up a wee bit. Gesturing with my mug, I then say, now what can I do for you? Karen says, well, your cats are the issue that we're here to discuss. We've had some complaints that they've been harassing some of the other guests' small animals, and people have said that they've seen your animals pooping under the trailer, which is a violation of the rental agreement. I say to Karen, wow, I'm sorry to hear that they're attacking other animals. I didn't think they were aggressive like that. As for the poop, it's in my rental agreement, and it allows me to have an outdoor litter box. I can show you if you like. Karen says, no, I know about your little agreement, but that's up in six months, so I think it's time we renegotiate again. I ask her, so basically we're talking about changes that need to be made by the time the lease is up, and you're being a champ and giving me a six month heads up? Karen tells me, yes, that's the gist of it. So 15 minutes go by and several mks later, I walk out of the office with a horrible stomach ache and a few pieces of important information. That one, an outdoor litter box would be permitted as long as it was enclosed and not put under my trailer. Two, permanent or freestanding enclosures are not allowed. Now this was meant to apply to sheds and the like, but Karen decided to use this to make my outdoor cat box an impossibility. Number 3. My cats would be permitted outside, as long as they're in an enclosed area and on a leash. And number 4. Pet fences over 3 feet high were not permitted, and they must be removed when not in use. So my newfound knowledge in writing, I set out to find a solution to the problem but I kept running into one thing or another that would break the rules. So after about a week of frustration, I decide to ask for a copy of my upcoming lease renewal, as I like to adhere to the letter of the law. Karen gleefully printed it up and signed it in front of me, as apparently she'd already drafted it and was expecting to deliver it to me well before the end of my current lease. I didn't even look at it until I got back to my place, but then, cue the malicious compliance. The new lease said essentially what I thought it would. That basically, if I could find a way to adhere to all these rules simultaneously, there wouldn't be a problem, but the tiniest infraction would result in a park fine. I began looking at the technical definitions of the words used in the lease, and finally discovered something that worked in my favor. Freestanding, not supported by another structure. And that was it. That was my ace in the hole. I now had an idea. I was still making payments on the trailer, and one of the stipulations of the finance agreement was that I maintained full coverage insurance on it until it was paid off. That meant that I could potentially report any damage to any part of the trailer inside and out, and my insurance company would cover it. My door awning, a standard 16 by 8 foot vinyl awning, was about 20 years old and badly in need of replacement. So I called around and found a place that does awning repair and installation. 
as well as solarium design. I met with a consultant, Mick, on Friday afternoon and told him exactly what I needed and why. He then smirked and asked for my insurance information and then told me he would call me the following Monday. So Monday rolls around and my boys have been inside all weekend. So we're going a bit crazy being cooped up together for so long and I was awake at 9 o'clock when the phone rang. I ran to it gleefully, expecting to find Mick on the other end, but instead I found a representative from my insurance company, who is calling to inform me that my repairs have been covered. I went to the office and told Karen's husband that I was having my awning repaired and was just waiting for an installer to call me. Fast forward 10 days, Karen and Dave went out of town for the weekend, so while they were gone, Mick and his crew spent 9 hours over 2 days putting up an absolute gorgeous screened outdoor dining enclosure with the snap-on canvas outer shell, and the whole thing was supported by the awning bracket and a cleverly designed series of poles that made absolutely certain that there was no way that it could be seen as freestanding or permanent. And since it was definitely not a fence and completely enclosed my outdoor litter box, I had complied with the letter of the law. Now on top of that, I also implemented a contingency plan. I have a particularly crafty friend who enjoys a challenge and was very much in the spirit of what I was trying to do. So he helped me build a 10 by 7 foot interior wooden enclosure that used the poles for the side screen wall of the awning extension as its primary support. So again, not freestanding. We also isolated a path between the RV door and the enclosure door, as well as blocking off the undercarriage to help corral the cats. So Sunday evening, Karen comes home to find this classy tent attached to my RV. And as expected, she throws a fit. Karen comes stomping over, but she can't find the door flap, as it wasn't marked. So she walks back to her car, drives over, and starts honking her horn until I come outside. Mind you, I'm sitting about 15 feet from her inside the enclosure, calmly smoking a cigarette, petting one of my cats. I let the honking go on for about 30 seconds, and as predicted, she starts screaming at me about how this was clearly a violation of the lease. But I spent the next 15 minutes showing her exactly how it was not in any way. And since the lease made no distinction as to what I could do, but rather focused on what I could not do, there was no language indicating that I'd done anything wrong. Karen then tried to claim the lease agreement was six months out and could still be changed, at which point I pull out the signed copy she gave me and showed her that she had signed it and dated it the day she gave it to me. She then tried to argue that I had forged her signature and created the document myself. I then informed her that I had sent a copy of the document to my insurance company a few weeks prior and we were both in the office under surveillance cameras when she printed, signed, and handed it to me. Now I can't remember what happened next exactly, but I do know that Karen tried to remove the non-load-bearing screen wall that isolated the door pathway, and she ended up getting stuck in the screen, breaking the frame, falling over, and then threatening me with a lawsuit. At which point, my neighbor comes over and stated loudly through the enclosure that it wasn't soundproof and he heard everything that happened. So in the end, I got to keep my enclosure and several other people at the park noticed my solution and did the same as quickly as possible. Within the next few months, I became something of a hero to some of the longtime residents of the park, because apparently I wasn't the only one being harassed. I was just the first one to find a solution, and as it turns out, the complaint was made by Karen herself, because she hated my cat, and she wanted to let her small dog run around, but couldn't stop him from chasing cats. That was like two and a half years ago, and I'm still in the same spot. Karen and her husband, on the other hand, were found to be too volatile to manage the park, and they were relocated to a 24-hour storage warehouse outside of town, where they provide on-site security. I still see them every so often when they come and get propane because it's cheaper here, and the look they gave me could kill. I have a bit of a wood shop set in my new space outside, and I now have six cats, a wife, and a stepdaughter who all love their indoor-outdoor porch. Another great example of people reading their lease contracts to spite someone else who's out to get them, guys, and I absolutely love it. I only wish I was sent or linked pictures with these posts because I need to see what drove Karen absolutely bonkers that day. Oh, and one more thing. I don't think you're allowed to destroy someone's property and then threaten to sue them, Karen. That's not how things work. And that, my friends, brings us to another end of our slash malicious compliance. Guys, I hope you enjoyed today's super satisfying stories. If you did, hit that like button. And if you're not subscribed, consider subscribing so you don't miss these crazy, crazy Karen stories. And if you missed the last episode on the channel, a super psycho Karen threatens to call 911 on OP because OP is walking on her sidewalk. That's right. Karen thinks she owns public sidewalks. Such a crazy story, so go check it out if you haven't. And myself and Stevie Boy will see you guys in the next one. We love you.